where we almost on a weekly basis have uh, folks who are sharing research findings uh, on the social, economic, and environmental impacts of China's overseas economic activity. Uh, before I introduce today's speakers and um, uh, and we launch into today's conversation, let me just tell you about a couple other, uh, let me invite you to a couple other events that we're having here at the GDP Center. Tomorrow morning, uh, if, if it's EDT for you, I should say good evening or good afternoon if it's not, um, we are having our, uh, we're having our GDP Center open house, but uh, since uh, we're not allowed to go on campus, we decided to make it an open house for the, for the world community. We're gonna feature two very distinguished uh, Boston University alumni, Lamine Barrow, who's at the African Development Bank, and Anna Maria Karaskia, who's at the Development Bank of Latin America. These two folks are gonna talk about how the COVID, uh, COVID virus and, and its economic impacts have impacted their regions, South America and Africa, and what their two institutions are doing to try to combat the virus. Uh, we also um, have a seminar series for our Human Capital Initiative. Um, and they will have a workshop, uh, excuse me, a, a webinar next Wednesday, October 28th, from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. EDT, featuring Alicia Holland from Harvard University. Her paper is on creative construction, how bureaucrats build and stop infrastructure in Latin America. Uh, next week's China Colloquium will feature uh, one of our pre-doctoral fellows and uh, Yale University PhD student, uh, James Sunquist. Uh, uh, does China offer bailouts to other countries will be uh, his presentation on Wednesday the 28th. And I want to have a special invitation to come join us next Thursday, the 29th, uh, at 9.30 EDT, where we will unveil a new interactive database and a new interactive data set, which we call China's Global Power, which uh, looks at Chinese foreign direct investment and Chinese development finance in global power plants um, around, the, around the world. If you go to our webpage, which is in the chat, uh, you can register and find out more about all these events. Well, uh, it's, it gives me great pleasure to, uh, to introduce my, my, three, my three colleagues for today's presentation. Uh, Rebecca Ray, uh, senior economist here, uh, who's worked here for a number of years, and, and two postdoctoral fellows who were just thrilled to have joined our team uh, it just, just in the past few months. Uh, first is Hong Bo Yang, who has a PhD from Michigan State University. Uh, and then uh, did a postdoc at the Smithsonian in Washington and has joined us a few months ago. Also, Blake Alexander Simmons, uh, who just received a PhD from Queensland in Australia and has joined us on this team as well. These folks are building a database of Chinese overseas development finance around the world and trying, uh, starting off a whole series of research projects on the relative impacts on uh, biodiversity and indigenous lands across the world. Uh, the way these seminars go, we ask the presenters to uh, make a presentation of 25 to 30 minutes. And uh, after that, we open it up to have a global conversation with all of you. If you look at the bottom uh, right-hand corner of your Zoom, you'll see a Q&A box. So I encourage you to uh, uh, put, put questions in there throughout their talk and then obviously afterwards. And I'll, I'll ask the questions on your behalf to the speakers. Um, and hopefully we can do a couple rounds of question and answers. Just to make it a little bit more human, please, when you ask a, uh, a question, just tell us your name and your affiliation so I can share that with the speakers and we can, uh, and we can move on. So please, without further ado, I'm excited to introduce my colleagues, Rebecca Ray, Blake Simmons, and Hongbo Yang. Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for that. Uh, that introduction, Kevin. Um, Blake will be driving our slides today, so you'll hear me asking him to advance when the time comes. As Kevin said, today we'll be discussing an ongoing project uh, and some preliminary results from a project we're calling the FAIR BRI, Forestry, Agriculture, and Indigenous Rights in the Belt and Road Initiative. To give you an idea of, of what that means, it's a lot to unpack. Blake, next slide, please. About a year ago, some of us at the GDP Center got together to ask some rather basic but rather challenging questions about the extent and uh, potential social and, and environmental benefits and risks from Chinese overseas development finance. 
To start with, we had to ask what's the full extent of this development finance? And by that, we mean finance commitments from their two major development finance institutions or DFIs that are active in overseas sovereign lending, the China Development Bank and the Export Import Bank of China. Now we know over the last 10 or 15 years, these two institutions have grown in importance to the point that uh, they're lending as much or in some years even more than the World Bank internationally. And for the last, well, the better part of a century, uh, researchers such as us, as, as well as stakeholders and government actors have been analyzing and interacting with the World Bank's activities. Uh, but we don't have the same benefits of uh, public annual reports or online data sets that we can easily download of the projects that have been financed and their locations. So we needed to put together a data set with a high, to be able to pursue spatial analysis analysis with a high level of confidence to do this. Once we had that data set, we were able to ask overall, looking at the portfolio of projects, what kinds of social and environmental risks uh, are represented in the portfolio and specifically how does this risk profile compare to the World Bank which many of us are used to analyzing and interfacing with. Uh, next slide please. So to give you an idea of this new data set work that we put together, as I said, we needed a data set with which we could do a spatial analysis with a high level of confidence. And so we put together this data set of uh, finance commitments covering 93 countries across the globe using universal definitions with a high degree of data validation, meaning we rely on agreement between Chinese and international sources that a particular finance commitment actually happened. We go back to 2008, before and after the launch of the Belt and Road Initiative, so that we can analyze uh, time periods both before and after, so that we can compare not only countries in the BRI technically and outside of, but also years before and after its launch. And finally, of course, the geolocation is an important element of this. 90% of the projects we were able to locate within 25 kilometers, enabling spatial analysis, and 90% of those we were able to locate at what we call the rooftop level to pinpoint precisely where they are. And here are the three kinds of examples uh, that are in the data set, which we will be releasing for public use in a few weeks. So keep your eyes on those uh, Global China Initiative newsletters and our social media feeds for when these will be available for you to use as well. But as you can see, we have a collection of points, individual buildings like Barbados's renovation of Sam Lord's Castle, lines like this power transmission project in Angola, and polygons like this hydropower plant and reservoir in Cambodia. Uh, next slide, please. When we put it all together, we come up with $462 billion, nearly half a trillion dollars in development finance commitments over this time period. To give you some context about what that means, over the same time period, the World Bank extended $467 billion in development finance commitments, or nearly an identical amount. So this is at the same level of what we're used to seeing from the World Bank. And as you can see, it's distributed widely across the entire world, particularly among low and middle income countries. Uh, and here you see uh, lines, dots and polygons, as I said, in the zoom in box first on the left of Northern South America, you can see the polygon of the Orinoco oil belt in Venezuela. In Africa, we can see a, collect a lot of lines, transmission projects for power, for communications, as well as transportation projects. And in Southeast Asia, we see a collection of all of them, hydropower, reservoir, polygons, as well as lines and dots. But this kind of map can be a little misleading in that every dot appears to be the same size, whether it's a major project or a minor one. So uh, next slide, please, Blake. It also helps to put together a map of the world where we look at the amount of money being committed to each country around the world. And here we see that while it is spread out across the world, there's a tremendous concentration among those top 10 countries, uh, which are highlighted here. And in fact, just these 10 countries account for 277 billion or 60% of the total. In fact, Venezuela, the top borrower, accounts for about one in every $8 in finance commitments from these two DFIs. So a tremendous amount of geographic concentration in a few places. Uh, next slide, please. There's also high concentration in the sectors. These top three sectors that you see here in this sector distribution chart, transportation, extraction and pipelines, and power generation and distribution, account for 336 billion or 72% of commitments, nearly three quarters of commitments across this time period. Next slide. 
But of course, our primary focus this morning are the risks and benefits intrinsic in the geographic distribution of these projects. Now, those of you who've been following the Global Development Policy Center's work over the last several years will know that we've approached the issue of development finance and social and environmental benefits and risks from the perspective of what gets financed, where it gets financed, and how it gets financed. And by that, I mean, uh, what gets financed? We've looked at uh, the distribution of financed portfolios across different kinds of projects, the extent to which the composition of portfolios might be compatible with the Paris Agreement or with definitions of green lending. Uh, regarding how development finance gets, uh, gets pursued, our most recent large-scale project involved uh, looking at the social and environmental protection framework, the safeguards that apply to development finance in different contexts. But in the present work, we'll just be focused on risk associated with the question of where projects get financed. And here you'll see we have listed out four different kinds of stakeholders, the global, national, enterprise, and community levels, and some potential benefits and risks that each can, uh, can experience through development finance. And for each one, we've identified a kind of sensitive geographic territory that we can use to begin trying to estimate the extent to which different portfolios of development finance projects are in line with these potential benefits or risks. So for example, on the global level, we all have global benefits from biodiversity. And so paying attention to the extent to which development finance portfolios are approximate to or overlap with critical habitats, particularly for threatened species, can be one way to analyze that. At the national level, there are national conservation priorities, which are implemented through national protected areas. So we can look at those as well. At the enterprise level, projects can be set up for longevity or for finding legal or operational challenges, depending on where they're situated with relation to indigenous people's lands and national protected areas. And of course, communities can either benefit with expanded livelihoods and improved living standards, or they themselves can be threatened and they can see the ecosystems they depend on for their traditional livelihoods threatened. So all of the above apply. And so now I'll hand it over to my colleague, Blake, who'll take us on a, an exploration of how looking at each of these kinds of territories can help us analyze a whole portfolio of development finance projects. Take it away, Blake. Thanks, Becky. So as Becky mentioned, uh, there's projects have the potential to bring both benefits and risks. And today we'll be focusing on the potential risks of Chinese uh, overseas DFI projects on biodiversity and indigenous people. But estimating these location-based risk is challenging in two major aspects. First, these projects are likely to have both direct and indirect impacts on people and the environment. For example, studies have shown that the risk of deforestation surrounding uh, road developments can extend more than 30 kilometers from the actual construction site before risks begin to tail off. And similarly, mines can exert profound impacts directly at the site level, but they can also have large flow on effects across the landscape and even at the global level, such as uh, added contributions to climate change. And these indirect impacts can also come from different causal pathways, whether by influencing practices of industries uh, or even external stakeholders. And the second challenge is that these impacts will be heterogeneous between locations, different sectors or types of projects, and even between individual projects within the same sector. For example, risks of deforestation and forest fires are heightened in highways or motorways compared to smaller roads, Uranium mines can pose larger health risks at greater distances than gold mines. Dams have been known to even exert significant risks up to 150 kilometers, specifically downstream of the site. And different energy sectors can pose greater threats to biodiversity, which I've highlighted on screen here for you. And all of that's to say that ultimately a robust, a robust impact evaluation will require tailoring to more localized contexts where you can account for differential impacts based on biophysical traits, particularly ecosystem services, uh, the type of infrastructure being developed and the characteristics of the communities living nearby. And all of that you'll be able to do with this new data set. But can we get a global outlook of the potential risks from all of China's overseas DFI projects? And for our first investigation using this data set, um, that is what we have been highlighting and what we'll highlight today. So our first objective was to develop global metrics of potential risk to biodiversity and indigenous people relevant to development. And by risk, we mean identifying lo locations where there is greater opportunity for loss 
and not necessarily greater likelihood or probability that a particular project will lead to loss. So first we created an index of biodiversity risk incorporating three main elements that Becky talked about. The first considers projects overlapping with designated regional, national, and international protected areas. This serves as um, an important political and ecological indicator of risk as development inside protected areas may violate uh, guidelines or commitments by lenders or the borrowing country. And further, given recent concerns about the effectiveness of existing protected area networks uh, to achieve our global conservation targets, like those highlighted uh, by Sean Maxwell and colleagues recently, placing additional risks within park boundaries may further jeopardize these conservation areas that are meant to act as a refuge for biodiversity. The second component considered was where projects overlap with areas defined as critical habitats based upon five criteria within the International Finance Corporation's Performance Standard 6. This important and representative ecological indicator of risk incorporates biodiversity features like key biodiversity areas, irreplaceable uh, protected areas, threatened species, and key habitats like forests and mangroves, all to identify areas that are of significant importance to threatened and endemic species, unique ecosystems and key evolutionary processes. And because we know that areas outside of protected areas and critical habitats can still be important for biodiversity, we included a final component to our biodiversity risk that incorporates the number of threatened mammals, birds, amphibians, and reptiles at a given location across the continuous landscape. Thus projects reaching maximum biodiversity risk will be located within a protected area designated as a critical habitat that hosts uh, some of the highest numbers of threatened species in the world. And we do this both for terrestrial uh, and coastal and marine ecosystems, uh, but most of our uh, discussion today will be based on terrestrial ecosystems. And finally, for our indicator of potential risk to indigenous people, we focused on the proximity of projects to territories known to be managed or controlled by indigenous people based upon the map of indigenous people's lands by Stephen Garnett and colleagues. Um, indigenous communities face similar direct and indirect impacts uh, mentioned previously, as well as additional threats to health, livelihoods, cultural and spiritual practices, and even potentially conflicts over territorial or human rights violations. Thus, we defined our risk index as a function of the differential risk posed to indigenous communities based on project locations near uh, indigenous people's lands. And this was guided by the literature's uh, estimated spread of impact for projects like mines, roads, and dams that I mentioned earlier to create a collective and generalized metric of potential risks across all types of projects. And when we could combine it all together, what does it look like? So here you can see a map um, of our study area uh, of all of our finance projects. Uh, in shades of blue, you can see increasing risk to biodiversity. In shades of red, you can see increasing risks to indigenous communities. And then shades of purple are where we're starting to see dual risk. So the Northern uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is a great example of where there are inherent risks uh, to indigenous communities. Uh, and in Southern Africa, we can see a lot more blue concentrated there, indicating greater presence of uh, sole biodiversity risks. Whereas the Amazon basin and Southeast Asia, that's where we're seeing a lot of dual potential risks uh, within these areas. So some locations are inherently more likely uh, to have risk associated with them than others. Our second objective was to uh, use this uh, database to evaluate the overall and maximum potential risks of all of these uh, geolocated projects. When we talk about overall risk, we're talking about average risk over the total project area. Uh, and so for things like lines and polygons, uh, those are spread over a large distance. And so we wanna look at the overall risk across that entire project. But we're also interested in looking at the maximum risk. That's the greatest risk at any single location in the total project area. And here I've highlighted an example of a road that may pass through a protected area. Um, although most of the road is relatively low risk, uh, it's important to be able to identify where it might have maximum risks uh, associated with it that we can potentially pinpoint. And finally, uh, as Becky mentioned, we'll compare these risks to of China DFI projects to World Bank DFI projects to get an understanding of where China sits uh, across the global lenders. And here are our results for the terrestrial uh, ecosystems. 
what you can see here uh, is that overall, um, risks are relatively low. We see a lot of really muted colors across the landscape, uh, particularly in a lot of the linear infrastructure, roads, uh, transmission lines, pipelines, those kinds of things. Um, overall, risks tend to be highest in the Northern Sub-Saharan Africa and in Southeast Asia, particularly uh, risks to indigenous peoples. But I want to draw your attention, uh, especially to the linear infrastructure, whenever we look at maximum risks. Now what we're seeing is that although these really expansive linear infrastructure projects like roads, railways, and pipelines have overall low impacts, many of them intersect important areas for biodiversity or indigenous communities at some point uh, along their trajectory. And this is really important to gauge to understand where we might be able to look further to identify solutions uh, to, to mitigate any potential risks. And here I've highlighted uh, average scores across countries to get an idea of uh, the global uh, national situation. We can see some countries like Mali, Ethiopia, and Laos have the majority or even all of their projects intersecting with indigenous people's lands, uh, whereas other locations like Fiji and Mongolia uh, have really high biodiversity risks in the majority of their projects. And other countries like Bolivia and Namibia uh, have a greater suite of uh, dual risk associated with them. And here I'm also going to just highlight uh, the marine impacts. There are very few projects that are um, either marine or lie along the coast uh, to be able to get as great uh, of a result. But here you can see sort of the general trends. We see a lot more biodiversity risk, largely because uh, a lot of the indigenous people land is terrestrial based. Um, but if we summarize by country, we can see a few standouts, uh, one of them being Vietnam, where all of the projects uh, have really high uh, biodiversity risk to marine species, as well as Gabon, uh, which has uh, a lot of dual risks associated when we look at the coastal marine sphere as well. And finally, how does, how does this all compare? Um, is this relatively good? Is this relatively bad to what's out there? And so when we look at the percentages of projects within uh, these different threat indices, we see that there's a lot of similarities between China and the World Bank. Uh, they have the majority of their projects are relatively low impact. Um, uh, but if we really uh, narrow down on specific differences, we can see that the World Bank generally has slightly more projects with high indigenous risk, uh, as well as biodiversity risk. Um, and so it's really important to recognize that a lot of this is mainly due to those unique overall risks within each country that I showed you earlier. Um, but of course, we can narrow down uh, and get more detail uh, when we compare project level risks between China and the World Bank, uh, considering, as I mentioned earlier, different sectors uh, of infrastructure, as well as the different components comprising biodiversity and indigenous risk. And for that, I'll hand it over to Hongbo. Thank you, Blake. Uh, so in addition to uh, the overall risk of China's project posed to uh, those uh, biodiversity and in this land, we also looked into the risk of China's project to individual uh, society ecologically uh, sensitive areas, including critical habitat, protected areas, and uh, indigenous people's land. So, and uh, uh, that were used to uh, generate OO uh, risk indicators. And uh, uh, the first analysis we did is to examine the area of psychologically sensitive areas that are located within the range possibly affected by uh, China's project. And as we all know, uh, the impact of a project can often go beyond the exact locations of a project and affect nearby areas. However, as Blake explained, uh, like how far the impact of a project can reach often different from case by case. And therefore, we uh, followed previous studies and established one by 10 and 25 kilometer buffers around the project to generate some kind of simplified representations of the areas that might be affected by China's project. And uh, uh, based on that, we uh, uh, evaluated how much of critical habitat, indigenous land, and uh, port areas that might be affected by China's project 
uh, if the impact or project can go one, five, 10, and 25 kilometers away. And uh, from a figure on the right, we can see indigenous land have the largest amount of area that might be backed by China's project, regardless how far the impact of project can reach, followed by critical habitat and uh, protected areas. And uh, we can see the amount, the total amount of the areas that might be affected by China's project increase rapidly uh, if, the, if, if the impact of the project can go further. However, even if uh, we can see here, uh, even if the impact of a project can only go one kilometer away from the project, there are still about 80,000 square kilometers of those sensitive areas might be affected by China's project. Go next, Blake. Um, and for risk uh, to threatened species, uh, we calculated a percentage of threatened species in four groups, including amphibians, birds, mammals, and reptiles that have their distribution range intersect with areas that might be uh, affected by the project. And again, we established one by and 10 and 25 kilometer buffers around China's project to represent the areas that might be affected by the project. And from figure on the right, we can see birds and mammals and the two groups have largest percentage that, that, that might be affected. Uh, regardless how far the impact of the project can reach, uh, over 25% of birds and mammals might be affected by the project. And in terms of the total number of species that might be affected by China's project, uh, even if the impact of the project can go only one kilometer away, there are still about uh, more than 1,000 1, or 14% of those threatened species might be affected by China's project. Let's go next, Blake. Uh, to better understand the risk uh, of posed by China's project, we compared the risk posed by China's pro uh, DFA project and World Bank DFY project. Uh, and uh, to make different project comparable, we uh, measure the risk using the proportion of the project location and its buffers overlapped with the sensitive areas, including project area, critical habitat, and indigenous people's land. And those overlap measurements tell us how much of area possibly affected by project are sensitive area. For example, uh, if we have a project that have four point locations and two of the locations are located within a project area. Then we say this project overlap rate with project area would be 50%. And uh, for light project, uh, we calculated this uh, the overlap using the percentage of the proportion of the uh, of light that's located within the sensitive areas. And again, uh, we established five, 10 and 25 kilometer buffers around project and calculated the proportional overlap uh, to say what would be risk if the impact of the project can go 5, 10, and 25 kilometers away from the project. Let's go next, Blake. So this panel figure shows the result of overlap with critical habitat. And in each of the four plots, we have five bar groups, uh, which show uh, the overlap um, with critical habitat of China and World Bank project in all sectors together, in transportation sector, energy sector, extraction sector, and agricultural sectors respectively. And uh, those four plot shows the result without buffer, with five kilometer buffer, 10 kilometer buffer, and 25 kilometer buffer around, uh, around the project. And from the, from the plot on the right, we can see the differences in uh, overlaps uh, between China and World Bank project. Uh, is inconsistent across different sectors. Uh, and we can see in energy sector and extraction sector, China's project have higher overlap than, or higher risk than World Bank project. But in transportation and agricultural sector, we see China's project have slightly lower or uh, low overlap or lower risk uh, than World Bank project. However, as indicated by the asterisk risk under the bar group, we can see uh, the differences uh, are mostly insignificant except in energy sector, uh, which means except in energy sector, China's project did similarly in awarding risk to critical habitat as compared to World Bank project. Let's go next. And this uh, figure shows the result of overlap with project areas. And from the figure on the right, we can see uh, uh, 
the China, in terms of the average overlap, China's project uh, consistently have a higher overlap than World Bank project and, uh, in, across all the sectors. However, the, those differences are mostly insignificant, except in energy sector, uh, which means except in energy sector, China's project also did similarly in awarding risk uh, to project areas as compared to World Bank project. Let's go next. And this slide shows the result uh, of overlap with indigenous land. And, uh, um, and again, we can see the differences in the uh, average overlap uh, between China's project and World Bank project is inconsistent across different sectors. And in energy and the extraction sector, we can see China's project have a higher overlap or higher, uh, higher risk than World Bank project. But in transportation and agricultural sectors, uh, we can see China's project have similar or slightly lower overlap than World Bank project. Uh, however, again, we found those differences are mostly uh, insignificant except in energy sector which means except in energy sector, um, China's project did similarly in awarding risk to indigenous land as compared with World Bank project. Let's go next. And for risk to certain species, we calculated the uh, average um, species richness of um, value of a threatened species around each of those projects to see uh, how many species on average might be affected by the project uh, and uh, from the figure on the right, we can see uh, the species richness uh, around China's project constantly higher than World Bank project across all the different sectors. And in this case, except in agricultural sector, all the differences are statistically significant, which means China's project uh, did not uh, uh, are not doing as well as World Bank project in awarding risk to threatened species. Go, let's go next, Rick. Okay, here's just a, a, a short summary of the major result from our study. And first, uh, we found China's DFIs reach, have reached uh, 462 billion from 2008 to 2019, which is very similar to the uh, World Bank investment during the same period, which is 467 billion. Uh, and we found China's investment mostly concentrated in a, a few countries and sectors. Uh, second, we found China's always, uh, overseas DFI project overlapped with a significant amount of socially and ecologically sensitive areas, uh, indicating uh, a high risk to those potential to those sensitive areas. And uh, as compared with World Bank project, we found China's project posed similar risk to critical habitat, indigenous people's land, project areas, but a significantly higher risk to certain species. And across different sectors, uh, we found China's project in energy sector have particularly higher risk than World Bank project. Let's go next. So what we presented here is just the first application uh, of this new data set. And definitely there are more and exciting things to explore. And here we just list uh, a few example topics the new data set may help to address. For example, uh, by looking into how the China's energy um, project distributed in relative to global energy poor areas, we may better understand um, how China's uh, energy project may affect uh, global people's accessibility uh, to uh, electricity. Uh, similarly, by looking at how China's project distributed uh, um, in, in relative to ho hot spot of invasive species, we may assess the potential impact of China's project on species invasion. Uh, other topics may include the impact of China's project on land cover change, uh, threat to habitat for connectivity, pollution to river network, and many others. Let's go next. So, uh, so this last slide just shows uh, members of our team, and uh, we would like to uh, thank Yashio Ma and uh, Kehan Wang, both of them are PhD candidate at BU, as well as a team of dedicated student researchers at BU they, for the great effort to compile this in, uh, great new data set. Um, last but not least, uh, thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we would be happy to take any question you may have about our work. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hongbo. Uh, great, converse, uh, great conversation and presentation by Blake Simmons, Becky Ray, and Hongbo. Uh, just a reminder to all of you folks uh, who are 
or engaging with this today, please uh, ask any questions that you might have in the Q&A function uh, and introduce yourself and then I'll read clusters of them to the, uh, uh, to the, to the presenters. Um, I, uh, we've been scheduling these uh, uh, at around 9 a.m. EDT um, so that we could have conversations with as many people across the globe as possible. Um, especially since so much of this is about China, we wanted to make sure that we could have conversations with uh, with folks in China. And our first question is from Reng Peng uh, from the Global Environment Institute at uh, uh, in China, and he would just like a, a little bit more description on how you, how we define geospatial and exactly what we mean by that. Another related question was. Um, uh, what do we mean by development finance, which I saw was answered in, in one of the chats, but uh, make sure uh, our, our uh, researchers answer, answer those two questions. We have uh, another question by Juliet Liu, uh, who's a postdoctoral fellow at Cornell University. And she asks, this location-based database and approach to risk analysis is great. I have two very different questions. Uh, one, I'm wondering how your assessment criteria of risk maps onto A, how non-Chinese, especially World Bank, developers and financial institutions assess risk in their own investment decision making, and B, how Chinese DFIs do the same. Um, Juliet, I'll get to your second question if we if we have time, but I want to make sure I can uh, I can get to as many folks as possible. Uh, uh, Diva Narain from the University of Queensland asks. How did China's DFI projects compare with World Bank projects in terms of numbers? And were IFC projects also considered? Um, uh, uh, Rishi Bondari from the uh, Climate Policy Lab at the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy that has a great BRI group asks, would you attribute differences bet uh, between World Bank and Chinese projects to differences in safeguards of various institutions and their compliance? Um, one, one more, and then I'll, and then uh, I'll take more after, after you folks reply to this cluster. Uh, Tian Baxter asks, "Thanks for the brilliant presentation." Uh, Tian Yan Baxter is from a China-based non-governmental organization, also the Global Environmental Environment Institute in Beijing. Um, Tian says, "I'm working on a project of reducing China-induced deforestation in Brazil and Argentina." Uh, I'm very interested in further knowing data and evidence about China's transportation and agricultural projects in these countries. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, why don't we ask our, our speakers to respond to those clusters. Uh, those of you who are in the audience, please continue to add, um, add questions into the chat. I see there's a, a bunch more here and I'll, I'll make sure I get to as many of them as we can. Thanks folks. Great. Well, why don't I get us started and we can go in the order that we presented. Uh, it, first of all, it's great to hear so many familiar names among the list of those questions. I'm so glad you're with us today. Um, to, to quickly redefine um, or to go back over what how we define development finance, how we define uh, its comparison between development finance institutions within China as well as in the World Bank. Um, we have been defining development finance here. There are many different ways to define it as sovereign finance commitments uh, coming from two of China's most important um, overseas uh, sovereign finance lenders who are the China Development Bank and the Export Import Bank of China. Um, when we compare it to the World Bank, then we try to make the most comparable analysis possible. And so we look for sovereign lending commitments. In other words, those that are coming from the two sovereign lending windows at the World Bank, the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the IBRD, and the IDA, the International Development Association, which lends to specifically low income countries. So we're not uh, defining development finance based on the level of concessionality, for example, as the overseas development, uh, the ODA, the overseas uh, Development Association does, um, but rather through the institutions. Um, I, I hope that answers the questions about the basic definitions from the economic side. Uh, regarding the questions of national differences and as well as the question about national safeguards, that was a, a really a great question. I'm glad you asked it. Um, so one of, the, I think, the most important findings, again, these are preliminary and these are not published yet, uh, but one of the most important aspects of these findings is that there isn't a tremendous difference, right? 
in part, this reinforces earlier work that we've done at the center about the importance of national institutional oversight of projects, because in earlier work that we've done looking specifically at social and environmental safeguards, both at development finance institutions and in national governments who borrow from those institutions, um, when one development finance institution says no to a project because it does not meet the safeguards, very often those countries are able to simply shop around the project to other development finance institutions. And similarly, where there is appetite at the national level to pursue green energy or to pursue projects in such a way that they avoid known sensitive territories, um, we do not see any evidence in previous work that China is uninterested in those projects, of course. If, if a, for example, um, the world's highest altitude and most efficient wind power plant in, in, in the world is a Chinese financed uh, wind power plant in southern Ecuador, the Bionaco Norte project, um, because Ecuador came to China with the proposal. Um, and so national institutions matter tremendously. The agency of national uh, interest groups and national finance ministries in proposing and overseeing these projects. Um, so I hope that helps answer somewhat uh, those questions about national differences and national safeguards. I'll turn it over to uh, my geospatial analyst friends to answer the more location-based questions. Yep, thanks Becky. So there was a question, uh, yeah, about what we mean by geolocated. And so these projects um, have all been uh, gone through a process of double verification uh, and a really big team of researchers has gone through to look through the finance documents to identify uh, and uh, verify on ground using global satellite images uh, where these projects are. And as Becky mentioned, for 90% of all of the um, 800 and so projects that we've identified, um, they all are verified within a distance of 25 kilometers. And even still within that 25 kilometer radius, the majority of them are well uh, within, uh, well under that 25 kilometer uh, distance. The majority of things that are at that sort of larger 25 kilometer distance are um, projects at municipal levels, um, such as you know, local townships or, or, or county level um, sort of regions. Um, but even still, about 85% of all of our projects have exact locations where we have uh, pinpointed uh, smaller construction sites, um, whether that's for buildings or dams or sort of smaller singular units to uh, these linear infrastructure uh, that we have um, been able to verify uh, the exact extent of where they start, where they end, and all the areas that they dip uh, in, in between. I hope that answers uh, the question about, yeah, the uh, specific geolocation uh, characteristics of these. Yeah, and I just uh, would like to quickly respond to DBS question about the number of um, the, um, the number of broadband project and uh, uh, China's DFI project involved in the comparisons. So in the, in this study for what for what about for World Bank project and China project, we only included the project that have pre, uh, precise project locations. And uh, for what uh, for, for the China project, we have about 550 project. And uh, for World Bank project, we have about uh, a, a similar amount. Uh, similar amount. Uh, it's about uh, 585 project included in the uh, in our compar in compar comparison analysis. And as we uh, said presented in uh, the presentation, um, the the value amount, um, the investment during the same period is very similar um, during our evaluation period from 2008 to 2019. It's about, uh, for China Park, it's uh, 462, and for World Bank Park, uh, for, for World Bank Project, is uh, 467 billion during the same period. Uh, thanks, Ang Thanks for those responses. I think we definitely have time for, for another cluster. Uh, this is... Uh, this is, I, I feel like a, a radio DJ and the phones are lighting up because we're getting lots of great, uh, great question. I'm going to try to do uh, a, a, a cluster in two different categories. There's a, a number of questions that are sort of methodological. How did you folks do what you did? And then others that are more on the on sort of some of the policy uh, implications and things like that. So let me just cluster a bunch that are um, that are methodological. 
uh, Grant Road from Boston University Center for the Study of Asia and Mayor a uh, Elkhorn, excuse me, from um, who's one of our postdoctoral fellows and also a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard, have questions about the time to the time series, um, asking. Uh, is this a time series or panel analysis where you're looking at the change over time and can we look at it this before and after the BRI or is it just uh, uh, looking at the whole period? Um, a question by Steve Ree from the Ford Foundation asked to what extent is the, are, have we ground truth the conclusions with respect to, uh, to their field applications, which is uh, echoed uh, by Albertus Monti uh, Promono, our, uh, one of our, uh, from the uh, from the Research Center on Climate Change at the uh, Indonesia University, one of our new partners on some of this work. Uh, Monty asks, um, how do you assess the impacts of the development projects, both the BRI and the World Bank, on biological richness? That's a specific question about what is the biological richness uh, indicator that you're using and what kind of data sets are used for that? Um, and if, uh, given that uh, probably didn't do any field work related to that. Um, a couple of uh, uh, Sha Li, one of our pre-doctoral fellows here and a PhD student at BU uh, asks, when comparing the differences between China and the World Bank, did you consider pr any project characteristics to control for that, such as the year of the project and the relative size of the projects? Um, uh, one last methodological one, um, uh, again from Divya Narain. Uh, did you include proposed or planned projects, question mark, and how, do you, how did you geolocate those? So that's a cluster of methodological ones. Since this is probably the, the last round of Q&A, let me just, um, let me, let me see what else we have here. Um, yeah, so more on implications and explanations. Alvin Kamba, PhD student at Johns Hopkins University, uh, uh, Department of Sociology and a, and a former pre-doctoral fellow here asks, well, do you have some preliminary explanations for your findings? Uh, for example, Chinese projects are higher risk to threaten species, higher risk than World Bank projects to energy. Um, uh, and can the data set include impact on marine environments such as ocean and seas? It's a question from, uh, from Alvin. Um, and we had one from our friend, uh, we, from uh, Paulina Garzon from the Sustainable Finance, uh, China Latin America Sustainable Finance uh, Initiative. She says, similarly, to, to, what to which factors do you attribute that the Chinese financing opposes higher risks than the World Bank uh, in the energy sector? What, what explains that? So a number of questions asking, um, asking what this might be. Uh, Emiliano Cabrera Roca asks, is there any way you have uh, that you could come up with uh, with numbers on the social and economic costs of some of these development projects? Uh, and the last one is uh, uh, Nora Sosmakat from Ergewald asks, how do you access the true, how do you assess the true impacts on indigenous communities? Uh, Ergewald, uh, Nora's Institute and others work on the implementation of safeguards. Um, and this is this is a big concern of theirs. So lots of lots of questions, but two 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 general buckets. A little bit more explanation on on how you did this work. We know it's preliminary. It'll be published in more detail uh, soon. And then some on how do you explain what's happened, and um, and what are some of the implications. And if uh, if each one of you could could uh, go through, answer those, and then make any concluding remarks that you might have. So why don't we go in the same order uh, that we did. Um, Blake, would you mind advancing the slides until we get to the timeline slide? I took this out of our initial slides simply because I wanted to save time to get into the geographic distribution analysis that I knew Blake and Hongbo were eager to talk about. Um, but we, the reason why our data goes back to 2008 is because we wanted 2013 to be, when, when the BRI was formally launched, to be kind of in the middle of the data set, to be able to look for any real 
real crucial pivots or, or growth around that point. And interestingly, what shows up is that, um, of course, there was a, a large spurt of, of sovereign lending commitments in 2009 during the North Atlantic financial crisis when, when Chinese development finance was, uh, if I may say so, kind of a lifeline to some developing countries to be able to cushion the impact of that. Uh, and of course, we see it decline thereafter. In 2013, we really see it begin to grow again. But after 2016, it's, it's fallen quite dramatically. And of course, it remains to be seen uh, how the world will rebuild after the devastating year of 2020 on economies around the world. So stay tuned for that. Um, we have not gone into the extent to which the differences we have seen among development finance institutions uh, or the lack of differences that we've seen varies over time. Uh, I will say that World Bank, the current environmental and social framework has not changed in terms of the way it defines the types of territories that projects are supposed to avoid, if possible, such as critical habitats. Um, and so Although that has been reformed recently in 2018, I believe the current version went into effect, uh, that should not be a major impact. So this is a first foray into answering, uh, asking and exploring these questions and, and hopefully we'll be able to add another dimension of analyzing how these things may or may not have changed over time in future iterations of it. Uh, there were a few questions about um, qualitative work, incorporating qualitative work into this. Uh, Steve Ree asked about ground truthing. Um, uh, colleagues from Indonesia talked uh, similarly about um, about working on the ground. Um, uh, Urgwald asked about true impacts on indigenous communities. And, and I think there's a common theme here that the, the GDP center always likes to marry quantitative and qualitative work together. We, we never want to trust the numbers without ground truthing things uh, with partners on the ground, but also through qualitative case study work to understand how mechanisms help how mechanisms work for the phenomena that we're seeing in numbers and to make sure that we're not uh, painting a picture that isn't connected to lived experiences. Um, and so this, what, what we've presented here are preliminary results from just the quantitative macro level aspect of a larger project. Uh, the next step of this project will involve incorporating case studies and qualitative work done uh, in conjunction with partners in the Amazon and in Indonesia. And so keep an eye out for the ability to add depth and color and ground truthing uh, to these results to explain mechanisms and also to push back to, to, um, and to challenge it a little. Sometimes qualitative data makes you rethink your quantitative data and we welcome that here. Um, uh, Alvin asked a question about marine ecosystems. And in fact, those are incorporated. I think Blake has some pretty slides on that. Um, so look, look for that in a moment. Um, uh, and then uh, Shirley asked about uh, proposed, I think it was Shirley asked about proposed and planned projects and how we geolocated those. And so it's absolutely true. The projects that haven't been built yet, you can't just Google them. You can't just find them on Google Maps, right? And so we spent many, many, many hours uh, with about a dozen very dedicated and brilliant student researchers pouring through project documents, pouring through press reports, pr pouring through government budget, uh, budget, um, documents as well as plans and engineering plans um, so so that we can rely on the geolocation data that we've presented for projects that have been built for projects that are halfway through being built and for projects that are still in the proposal uh, in the proposal stage the one requirement for being included is that the project financing has been formalized so regardless of whether the financing came before or in the middle of the construction process for projects that have footprints uh, we wanted to be able to include them all uh, my, the only closing statements i have is that i'm just thrilled that you all here are here and having this discussion again these results are all preliminary uh, the data set itself will be released um, for public work with it uh, in a few weeks time and i really look forward to continuing these discussions once that has happened and exploring all the ways that we can use this data together as a community of researchers once that happens. That's it for me. Thanks, Becky. Uh, so I will address, um, from what I can remember, some of the other remaining questions. There were a couple um, of questions about uh, specifically sort of the, the characteristics that we included. Um, and so in terms of thinking about those different components of uh, biodiversity risk uh, that Monty mentioned, so here we're looking at threatened species um, and 
So we took the richness uh, across the globe, but um, there's actually uh, specific uh, locations, particularly within Indonesia and Malaysia, um, that really are outliers in terms of global threatened species. And so what we did, we did, um, uh, we modified this to be more representative of the global situation uh, and just defined kind of this function here, uh, which uses the global median uh, value of uh, 11 threatened species per square kilometer uh, to define our sort of midpoint of potential impact regarding uh, threatened species. And I'll just show you um, sort of uh, how things line up. Uh, Monty, uh, coincidentally, this is um, an Indonesia and Malaysia example for you. Uh, but so this is sort of what it looks like uh, when we add them all together. We've got that threatened species index. That index is weighted by existing human modification so that areas that are uh, dense, built up cities um, are not given the same weight of threatened species richness as areas that are still uh, relatively intact uh, for biodiversity. Uh, as well as critical habitats. There's some richness to that. Uh, sites that are classified as likely critical habitats, uh, which meet um, all of the uh, IFC criteria, as well as high uh, spatial resolution information versus potential uh, critical habitats, which receive half of the importance uh, in terms of score um, because they're, they may not uh, have high spatial resolution or there may be some uh, concerns about whether they actually qualify for the criteria, uh, as well as the uh, designated protected area network locations. And this is sort of what it all uh, adds up to um, in the end here, highlighting those examples of where um, there is greatest uh, opportunity for lost um, in, in this example, uh, Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, and there was another question about the uh, uh, applicability of this to the marine realm. Um, and we do incorporate that. Let's see if I have, uh, yeah. So we go through uh, in here and for all of our projects that lie along the coastlines uh, um, of water bodies or, or oceans, we, want, we take into account the cumulative human impact um, that was developed by Ben Halpern uh, and colleagues to uh, account for the relative uh, health or intactness of uh, marine, uh, of the marine ecosystems. And so in this case, uh, what we do is we, for all of the projects that are coastal, uh, enough to have consideration here, we uh, place more emphasis on those uh, projects within relatively healthy or intact uh, marine ecosystems, just as we would do uh, for the terrestrial ecosystem. Of course, uh, the marine realm presents a lot more complexities, sort of at, uh, as I think you mentioned um, in your comment that there are uh, a lot of, you know, point source pollution uh, aspects to take into account. And a lot of that is going to be due to um, particular topographic characteristics uh, of the area or um, the specific uh, methods that, you know, a lot of these power plants uh, will use. Um, in their process. So uh, the short answer is that we don't spend a lot of time really diving into all of the necessary things that we would uh, need to, to really get a good robust uh, estimate of marine impacts. Um, but now with this data set, it's definitely possible um, and really, really excited about seeing now what the academic community can do with this data set to investigate all different types uh, of context and potential aspects um, that you know, we can't do just as ourselves, but we're really excited um, that the community will not be able to do. Okay, and I would like to uh, address a few questions about the comparison between um, China's project and the World Bank project. And one question is about uh, in the comparisons, whether we can show some, for example, attribute of a project, a type of um, project, for example, for energy project, there are um, not different type of uh, uh, power plant, on the coal power plant and a hydro, uh, hydro power plant, something like that. And uh, in this study, we didn't, um, we didn't uh, consider that because for this analysis, we just uh, want to pro provide a global outlook of the potential risk of China's project. So we we did consider uh, some, we did did consider the, the sector factors. We divided uh, we made the comparisons across different sectors, but uh, we didn't um, uh, pay uh, specifically controlled the attribute 
uh, of the project. And uh, with this new data set, I, uh, I think uh, it is definitely possible. And uh, there's a, a lot of factors to control. In addition to the attribute of the project, we may also uh, consider, for example, uh, the psycholo uh, psychological context around this project that may also would uh, affect the potential impact of this project to biodiversity or as well as the indigenous people. And uh, there's also a few, a couple of questions about uh, the potential reasons uh, that uh, why the, the, the China's energy sector in particular, uh, in energy sector, China's project have a higher risk than World Bank project. Um, I do not have very uh, um, precise look, um, explanation for that, um, but there's a, perhaps a few uh, possible reasons for this because for energy project, especially for example, uh, the, uh, the hydro dams, they um, manage, perhaps they may manage um, driven by uh, the the, uh, for example, the, the local topographic uh, situations and the, the availability of um, the, the, the energy distribution, for example. Uh, so, uh, in, and uh, we, there are some, uh, there are some uh, global study that about uh, the potential for, for example, uh, hydro energy. And uh, we found, um, uh, we found some, some of the uh, hotspot of these rich areas are uh, overlapped with some of the biodiversity hotspot. So that's perhaps uh, part of the reason for why the energy sector that have particularly higher uh, risk as, com uh, as compared with other, other, other sectors. And uh, as compared with World Bank, the Chinese have high risk perhaps um, in, that's beca perhaps because um, Ch um, that's um, one possible reason perhaps is that they uh, in, in establishing this project, China pay, uh, paid less attention to the potential risk to um, to uh, the biodiversity as well as uh, indigenous people's land, and uh, that definitely uh, worth more detailed analysis, more ground truth uh, to do such kind of analysis to um, to uh, validate this result as a global level. Thanks so much, Hongbo. Um, we're running out of time here, um, but uh, really want to congratulate all of these uh, folks for the great work that they've uh, that they've started. Uh, definitely stay tuned for a lot of analyses coming to this, and soon this will be a um, a publicly available data set that uh, that other folks can take advantage of as well. Thank all of you, uh, all 100 plus of you that were a part of this conversation today. I invite you all to have a conversation with us tomorrow about uh, the impacts of COVID in Africa and South America and how development fa finance institutions in those regions are trying to uh, attack the virus and protect the vulnerable. Uh, and please, please join us next week uh, for same time, same station to, uh, uh, to hear James Sun Sunquist talk about uh, uh, Chinese bailouts, question mark. And finally, next Thursday, uh, to have a conversation uh, where we'll uh, unveil a, a new in, a new data set where all the data will be able to be downloaded and so forth uh, next Thursday. Please go to our webpage, www.bu.edu slash GDP uh, to register for some of these things and find out more about our work. Have a great day, everyone.